from Chesapeake, Virginia, WHKT presents Sports Scene. Sports Scene features local, regional, and nationally acclaimed guests and excellent interviews. Follow Sports Scene on Twitter at Greg Bick. Now here is Greg Bickaveras. All right, thank you very much, Joe Daniel. Glad you're with us right here on Sports Scene. We are live, as always, on this humid July 19th. Of course, Sports Scene is an interview show each Wednesday from 12 to 1. Also, sports highlights on NNPSTV.com. Tell your friends about 1650 AM, 92.5 FM, Twitter, at Greg Bick, at Sports Highlight, at GJBTV, HR Online Mall Com. Hello to all the locals and tourists as well. Thank you to our military guest lineup, featured guest, signature guest, Donald Dell, who's the tournament chairman and co-founder of the tennis event in Washington, D.C., legendary sports agent, also played tennis as well. Sponsors on GJBTV.com, Marketplace Sponsors, guest lineup presented by Mi Casita Mexican Restaurant with two great locations in Virginia Beach. You can see their link on the restaurant section on Hampton Roads, OnlineMall.com. Phone line presented by Outback Steakhouse in Kempsville in Virginia Beach. And, of course, thank you to Spaghetti Eddie's. Uh, notes, Aaron Judge, for the most part, doing very well as a rookie with the Yankees. Second half of Major League Baseball season is well underway. American League, of course, won the um, All-Star Game 2-1 to one as well. NBA Summer League was really entertaining as well on the ESPN family of networks. I guess the story for the summer is hot heat, the beach, the pool, the air conditioning, and, of course, cool beverages. Great interviews, business segments, highlights, commentary, what teased me off. Thank you for making the habit to listen to Sports Scene Weekly, and we love our regulars and newcomers as well. And, of course, interact 24-7 at Greg Bick on Twitter, G-R-E-G-B-I-C. My background, GJBTV.com. Stay tuned for Sports Scene live after this. Catch up on archived editions of Sports Scene by going to GJBTV.com and clicking the YouTube image on the homepage. Now back to Sports Scene with Greg Bicaveras. All aboard! <laughs> I, 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 I. All right, we're live right here at 12.09, and having grown up in Virginia and played tennis and gone to George Mason and interviewed the legendary Charlie Brotman way back in the late 80s. And of course, knowing this legendary figure in the Washington tennis scene, not only the tennis scene, but the sports scene as well, accomplished agent, uh, founder of the City Open. It's changed name several times, but the uh, legendary mark of tennis continues in the Mid-Atlantic. Let's welcome Mr. Donald Dell to Virginia Beach. How are you, Donald? Fine, thank you. Thanks for welcoming me. Very Pleasure good. to be here. Very good. Uh, you had a, um, before we start, you had a TV program for a while, the Donald Dell interview talk. Is that still going on? Yeah, we're going to we're gonna start that again uh, probably September 1, uh, maybe in August. We're, we're debating whether to start it in August or September. We've just agreed to move forward again on our second version, second year. Just like down here, Donald, you've been down here several times in Kings Mill. We have a women's golf tournament. We had a men's golf tournament for years. The, the tennis tournament in D.C. has been around for decades. Of course, you started it. It's been on clay courts with legendary names like Rosewall, Ash, Solomon, Connors, Vilas. What is the state of the tournament today, and what is the state of tennis today in the Mid-Atlantic area? Well, leave tennis aside for a moment, but, but the tournament this year is a phenomenal uh, event uh, we've we've just had two or three people enter in the last week under what you call a wild card scenario where someone calls up uh, and asks if you have a wild card can they get in and enter at the last minute and we have four wild cards and and so our men's field has been is staggering we have four former winners in the event we've got three players uh, in the top ten uh, Gail Monfils is the defending champion. Dominic Team, uh, who won uh, uh, and got through the finals in the Italian Open. Dominic Team is number seven in the world. He's coming from uh, Austria. He's never played here before. He's brand new. Uh, Milos Ranic, who got to the semis of Wimbledon last week and lost to uh, Federer, excuse me, in the quarters at Wimbledon. He won our tournament three years ago. Ranic has just entered as a wild card, so he will be here. Del Potro from Argentina, who's won the tournament four times, has entered. Uh, and then Nick Kyrgios, the Australian guy who has 
tons and tons and tons of talent. You just never know which part's going to show up on the court. He is also uh, entered. Uh, and we have a young uh, uh, Russian player, Igor Dimitrov, who has entered as well. So it, it just, and then along with those international entries are the best in the Americans. The Bryans are coming back. Uh, they've won the doubles four times. Uh, the, the men's player, John Isner, has been in the finals here twice. He loves Washington, always plays well here. Uh, along with him is Stevie Johnson and Jack Sock. So the top three ranked Americans, although they are not in the top 15, they're in the top 20, and that's your next question about American tennis, we have them all playing. So I'm in a state of shock at the entry. And then I suddenly flip over, and uh, yesterday on the women's side, the number two player in the world is a, is a lady player named Simone Halev from Romania. And we have a rule in, in the WTA, Women's Association, if anybody ranked in the top 20 that enters late, you must accept their entry. And we're, we're deli- delighted. So yesterday, at about 2 o'clock, we got an entry from her uh, as a number two player in the world uh, entered in the women's tournament. So, you know, I'm sort of out of breath talking about sure, these different players sure. and, the, and the women's field. Uh, is equally as strong as the men's field. It's just quite phenomenal, quite phenomenal. And, of course, you happen to be in uh, the Wimbledon. Of course, Sam Curry from the United States did very well making the semifinals, and Venus Williams even had her advanced stage making the finals with all the drama going on with her. So it seems like American tennis is picking up a little bit, maybe not to the level where, you know, when you saw Ash, Solomon, Connors, McEnroe, Agassi, Chang, that level, but at least it seems like it's making a comeback. Well, you know, two things are happening in the world of tennis around the world. First of all, when people say, well, what's wrong with American tennis? The honest answer is that the world of tennis has outgrown the situation. When I played, you know, you had three dominant countries. You had America, you had Australia, you had England, and also you had France. And they they won the bulk of, of, of the tournaments in one way or another before it went open in 1968. With the advent of the ATP computer and worldwide rankings, today, the top 100 men players in the world, 48 of them are from Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. That's a whole new world. So what's happened is the game has just expanded uh, and become much more of a global game. And, And, of course... I like to say the Croats and the Serbians and the Eastern Europeans, they use tennis as a vehicle to get out of their countries and travel, much the way the American boxers did years and years ago, head, headed up you know, by Muhammad Ali uh, in, in the 50s and 60s. I mean, it, it's just been a, tack, a ticket for a very good young player by the name of Novak Djokovic to travel around the world, and suddenly he developed and got better. I remember I saw him first play. Uh, he was 17 years old. He was a pretty good player, steady player. And then suddenly, when he became 22 or 23, he's number one in the world. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the game has grown. And, and, of course, Spain is enormously uh, popular now. There's six or seven world-class Spaniards uh, headed up by Nadal. Nadal is the one you hear about, but there are many behind him. Uh, and, and it's just it's incredible uh, how broad the sport is. And the second thing, I think, for your viewers and listeners to understand is, for whatever reason, the game is becoming older in the player side. I mean, many of the four semifinalists at Wimbledon were all in the 30, beyond 30 years and older. That, that's never heard of before. And I think Federer being the, the best example, at, at 35, he wins Wimbledon. He won the Australian. He's going to turn 36 next month. And you say, well, why is that happening? And I think it's happening for two reasons. One, uh, the sport has gotten bigger and bigger with money, and the players want to continue because the money is so big. And then secondly, they take much better care of themselves. The the trainers and the the physicality of the sport. You know, a guy like uh, uh, Federer will will travel with a physiotherapist, a, a coach, a hitting partner. He's got a, about five guys in his, in his group because he's making millions of dollars for the first time. These players can afford to, to literally have a traveling coach. I mean, which is sort of foreign to me. Can you imagine a Jack Kramer or a Poncho Gonzalez or even a 
Ken Roseville or John Newcomb having a coach travel with him. I mean, it, it just sort of defies your own own mind about it. That's sure. a whole new trend. But they're all taking a hell of a lot better care of themselves physically, so they're playing longer and better. But it's funny, we're talking to Donald Dell, tournament chairman and co-founder of the City Open, legendary sports agent, also a former tennis player as well, that you looked even back in generations gone. Connors played up in the 90s still, till, and he was in his 40s, I believe. Then you look at Rosewall, Velas, even Tomas Muster played a long time. There's guys that do play tennis either a short period or women like Gabriella Sanatini who got out of tennis really early, um, but also the ones that sustained for a long time like the uh, Williams sisters. Well, it's it's remarkable. You, you know, you've mentioned several names. I mean, Rosewall played, got to the finals of the U.S. Open when he's 39 years old. Exactly. Uh, but on the other hand, a guy like Bjorn Borg, he retired at 26, and yet he had been he he'd won the French. Are you ready? Six times, and he'd won Wimbledon five times, and then in the sixth year he lost defending his championship to John McEnroe, and then he retired. So you're right. Either they either end early and get out because either they really don't enjoy the travel and the pressure and all the accoutrements that go along with being a world class player, or they do enjoy it or need the money and want the money. Now, the money is you know quadrupled in the last twenty years. I mean, can you imagine just thinking about this first round loser at the U.S. at the uh, Wimbledon? Uh, was getting 35,000 pounds if he lost in the first round. If he got through two matches and he lost in the third round, he earned 147,000 pounds. That's about $200,000. I mean, that's many of people's salary for the year. Uh, at, at many, many jobs, a $200,000 salary is not a bad salary in America. So these players, recognizing the money has gotten so enormous, they're sticking around longer and longer. But to do that, they got to take care of themselves. Absolutely. Physically. Let's talk about the City Open. It's changed names. I remember right out of finishing college at George Mason, it was I was working in the ProServe TV truck, and that was your business as well. It's uh, it's changed names, but I guess that's just corporate America today, Donald. The sponsorship dictates everything. Well, we've been very lucky. Uh, no, number one, the Washington Star was our first sponsor. We 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 announced the tournament. Johnny Harris and I together as co-chairman in 1969 started the tournament at this public park. Uh, Rock Creek Park, which Arthur Ashe asked us to put it in a, uh, a fully integrated neighborhood, and he would play the tournament. We did, and he played ten times. Now, he won it only once, but he played and supported the tournament every year for ten times. And so we started with the, with the Washington Star. We've only actually had, then we had Volvo, uh, and then we had uh, Leg Mason for 18 years, and now we have the City Open is, is going on their seventh year. If you if you looked at the world of tennis in America, sincerely, Washington is the second oldest tournament, pro tournament, in America because the U.S. Open went open in 68. I was the Davis Cup captain in 68 and 69 by happenstance. I had the best ten players in America on my squad. Sure. And in 1969, when I started the Washington tournament, we got rid of the under-the-table player guarantees and put up prize money. We put up $25,000 in 1969. Today we're putting up a little over $2 million in our tournament. And so the money has, has grown like topsy over and over and over. But uh, our sponsorship, we've only had five sponsors, and our tournament is in its 49th year. So, as you say, sponsorship is what the pro sports, any pro sport is all about. You have to have good sponsors, and you have to have good television. And Washington has been phenomenal in its uh, television. We have 170 hours of live television in America on the Tennis Channel, who is bought by Sinclair Stations over in Baltimore now. And they have together, they have 60 million households on the Tennis Channel. And we're in everybody's household, 170 hours in our tournament. And then internationally, we have uh, of, of three international feeds with the ATP. We're into 182 countries and over 4,000 hours, some live, some delayed. So the television side of the, uh, of the tournament where we are in Washington is second only to the U.S. Open. It's really quite phenomenal. 
Yeah, I love the event. I mean, I went to George Mason, knew of you when I was a kid back then, or even though I grew up in the Virginia Beach area. Just a great, great event in Washington, D.C. When people turn on the TV during the summer and they see the tournaments in Atlanta, Canada, Ohio, Winston-Salem, and yours, they're really great tournaments as we head to the U.S. Open. But what is your thoughts about the, uh, the mixed doubles and this world team tennis? I've got mixed emotions about it. I'm a traditionalist. I like the tennis court to be one color. And to me, it's kind of gimmicky. You're a traditionalist yourself. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I think a couple things. Number one, world team tennis is a really different kind of event. It's to get people interested in enjoying tennis. It's men and women combined in 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 what much more of a team match. In other words, in in tennis, the the great thing about tennis, if you're injured or you're playing badly, you can't call timeout. You can't substitute. You can't start over in, in world class tennis. In world team tennis, you can. If if you, you could be serving and a, and a guy serves a fault and not, and not feeling well, he he can bring a substitute right in off the bench. It's much more of a team thing. It's much more. Uh, I think it's it's entertainment for two weeks in tennis. We have a a, a world class team here in, in Washington, the Castles, which are owned by Mark Ein, who's a good friend, and I think they play down at GW in front of about 2,000 people, but it, it's a different kind of sport. It's really a team competition with men and women playing together on one team for points. It's like ping-pong scoring, and the rallies uh, are generally short and different, whereas then you swing out to, uh, a week later, you swing out to the uh, City Open, and you know, you've got... Uh, three different stadium courts, all that television, and a tremendous uh, international field of uh, of elimination. You know, if you lose, you're out, and uh, and the tournament is just competitively so much more difficult in playing three set matches in 90 degree weather than you know than playing four or five points in a, in a ping pong score system. But I think both are very popular, and, and Mark's done a great job of promoting tennis uh for downtown washington uh for the castles i i have no problem with it i think it creates interest in tennis in general but but the, the real tough purists that follow the sport know the difference between you know the wta and the atp tours we're just like the pga tour in golf i mean it's very hard to get on the calendar television is very important and the player fields and sponsorships the whole ball game and uh as I say, we give out uh, $2 million in player compensation, and we have men and women. And uh, the women, this year with Simone Holub now entering yesterday, the number two player in the world, the crowd's going to go crazy because the women have become very popular. We've only had it uh, five years. It was a men's only tournament for 44 years, and uh, now the women are there, and people really enjoy both. Yeah. And so if you have a, a, a weak match on the center court, somebody doesn't play well or is beaten easily, you've got another match going on two other stadium courts. So you've always got an ability to please your crowd with good play on different courts. Yeah, it's and that's cr- a big advantage. It's great entertainment. It's a lot of fun to watch and go from court to court. Let me ask you, because I respect your opinion in tennis more than anybody, uh, we, we still hear McEnroe on TV, Chris Everett still on TV, and of course they do a great job with the different uh, networks. But how come Connors has stayed away or been kind of distant? Has that always been his personality? Uh, he was coaching for a few players, but he seems like he does things in short stints and then kind of disappears for a while. What's up with Connors? Well, you know, I represented and managed Jimmy for nine years, sure. so I, I feel I know him quite well. He, first of all, his number one, two, and three characteristic is competition. He's very competitive in anything he does. He's playing golf now. He'll he'll bet you a whole sure. by hole in any any amount you want to play for. I mean, he he just loves competition. He loves the action. Uh, he sold more tickets than anybody in American tennis for ten years. But his attention span, I think, is very short lived, and. He did, for example, he, I, I got him a four-year contract doing television for NBC at the Olympics. And uh, he did it for the first two years. And then he lost interest. He just said, you know, I, I don't enjoy that much. He didn't want to continue. So they parted company amicably at his request. Now, m- most people don't do that. He also worked in London at Wimbledon on television for the BBC. McEnroe uh, takes up, you know, an awful lot of oxygen. First of all, John is really good. I mean, he's as good as it gets. Chrissy, I think, is awfully good on the women's side. But then you have, you know, Tracy Austin on the women, Martina on the women. You have, on the men's side, you've got Patrick McEnroe. So you've got 
a lot of people doing television in front of Jimmy, and I think that kind of made him lose interest a little bit. And he just, he moved, as I say, his attention span is very short-lived in anything he does. And he's a, he's a scratch golfer now. He plays that probably five days a week. But, he, you know, if he had a tour for seniors, he'd play the tour of seniors if the money was right. And he's good enough to do that. He played, you know. Until, he got to the semifinals of the U.S. Open when he was 37 years old. Mm-hmm. So he played a hell of a long time in American tennis. Uh, but I just think he's not... Uh, he's not what what you would call a die-hard tennis fan, in, in my opinion. Right. He's a tennis player. He doesn't. I, he's coached a little bit. He did coach uh, McEnroe. Uh, excuse me. Coached. Uh, um, um, God, now I've lost his, the, the, the the great American is being inducted in the Hall of Fame. Andy uh, Roddick. Andy Roddick. He coached for a couple of years. He, you know, he coached. I mean, it's a funny game. He he, he coached Martina. He, he coached Sharapova for one day. Right. She hired him. They coached for a day, and they and then they parted company. Wow. I, I don't know why, but it lasted one day, which makes my point. He, he you know, his attention is very short lived. He if, if he wanted to do it, he could do it, and he could do it damn well. I've done television shows with him where I did the play by play. He did the color. He's very good, but I just don't think his heart's in it. I don't. I don't think he wants to go to a studio and sit around six or eight days, six or eight hours to be on two hours. That's not what he wants to do, so he stopped doing it. He yeah. could have continued. He's a Virgo, like a lot of us Virgos that are left-handed, that are type A, proactive. I totally yeah. understand. But you also had a gentleman announced for you for several years on uh, Pro Serve McKay. What's he doing now? Well, Barry, unfortunately, died a sudden death uh, mm-hmm. in the hospital about four years ago. Mm-hmm. He was a very good announcer, and he, he, he had his intestine um, somehow got infected and exploded, and he died from internal infection, mm, mm, very sadly. Yeah. Now, let me ask you a question, too. When you look at the, the sports landscape in the D.C. area, the Redskins, you got the Ravens, you got the college sports, they're all trying to compete for that entertainment dollar when the attention span is very low. And, of course, people are addicted to their phones and their computers now, and that does affect attendance as well. They're trying to bring the more home atmosphere to these sporting events. Is that something that should be a concern as we get more and more into technology? Donald? You know, I think absolutely. If you, if you looked at uh, some numbers, uh, let, let, let's take an example. Uh, golf, tennis, and baseball, the viewing audience, the average age is 61 years old in, uh, in some of the ATP tours. The women were 55. Uh, in baseball, uh, it's, it's, it's 53 to 55. Those are in other words, a lot of your audience is an older audience. The younger millennials that are coming up, they're much more interested in having six choices on their phone, mm-hmm. you know, or, or 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 their iPad. I mean, they're moving around and, and they care about the devices more than they care going to the games. I think uh, the, the Ted Lerner and the owner, the owner of uh, the Nationals, they've done a phenomenal job of promoting the sport. But it, it's interesting that. They're building baseball stadiums now, San Francisco, Washington. They're all about 40,000 maximum. They're not, you know, in, in football, they were building 60 and 80,000 seat stadiums. You know, the old, um, the old, uh, uh, FedEx field football stadium, when, when Dan bought the team, they had about 85,000, uh, seating out there. And he has cut that way back. Uh, for two reasons. One, he's cut it back to about 68,000. And because the the Redskins haven't had that successful record, he's lost a lot of people as far as season ticket holders. And it's, and it's very expensive in football. But the point I'm getting at is the crowds, because of the ability of technology, the crowd at the site has gotten smaller. And I think baseball has adjusted to that in the size of their stadiums. Uh, for example, you know, in tennis in Washington, you know, our stadium holds 7,800 people, and then we have two other outside stadiums. So, I mean, we can we can hold you know 15,000 people at the site, but we don't. Uh, I don't want a 20,000 seat stadium because mm-hmm. I can't fill it. Right. And then, you, and the reason is you got parking problems in the in the park there. You couldn't put 20,000 people there if you wanted them, and so a lot of different problems occur. But I, I think. Baseball has figured that out, and their new stadiums are much smaller. I mean, 
you know, somebody, the San Francisco has a gorgeous stadium. I've, I've been to it once or twice. And, you know, you hit a home run, it can go out in the, into the river, into the water, rather, the ocean, uh, over that uh, center field or right field fence. But it only seats like 41,000 people. Uh, whereas the, take Ohio State football is 102,000 people. Now, college football is different because you're drawing on colleges and, 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 and younger kids that want to support their college team. Sure. That's different than an NFL team. I mean, I think a lot of these stadiums, uh, they're still getting big crowds in the NFL, but as the television expands in distribution, those crowds are going to come down. Well, yeah, look at, look at the uh, Chargers in, uh, in L.A. You know, they're in L.A. now. They're playing in a, a stadium of less than 50,000 people, and, of course, the Rams are close by as well. But you're right, television dictates everything. And leave us with a final thought, cityopentennis.com, coming up uh, later this month, July 29th through August 6th. Uh, Donald Dell, tournament chairman and co-founder, give us a final thought. We, I could talk to you for hours. Well, n- number one, the tournament field is going to be the strongest we, we may have ever had in men and women. The ticket sales are going very well. We, we'd love the public to come out. The one beauty about the tournament is the players are, are much closer to the audience in all the different courts. They have to come in and out of the locker rooms. They walk through the crowds. They sign autographs. They stop. They answer questions. You know, if you go to the U.S. Open in New York, you don't get, you can't get near a player. It's a much, much bigger, massive thing, and they're traveling with bodyguards everywhere and so forth as they move them through the crowds in little golf carts and stuff. We don't do any of that. In Washington, they're walking to the courts. They go through the crowds. And so I urge everybody that has any interest in the sport, come out and try it. We, we, we start, you know, at uh, 4 o'clock. The, men, the women start at 2, the men at 4. We play into the evening. It goes as late as midnight. And it's a lot cooler, you know, from 5 to 10 than it is from noon to 2. So we did that very deliberately. We could get nighttime tennis is a, is a big deal in Washington. And we'd love to have you come out, uh, as, as many as want. Right. Very good. Donald, thank you very much for your time, your talent, and your treasure, all that you've meant to tennis. We hope to get you back on again, and also what you've done for television, for sports, and for business and entertainment and law throughout the country. Well, that's a mouthful, but thanks very much uh, well, for your, all your you've, thoughtfulness. You've inspired a lot of people. Thank you, Donald. Okay. Thank bye-bye. you. All right, Donald Dell right there, the tournament chairman and co-founder of the City Open, an elite tennis tournament in Washington, D.C. on the ATP level. Greg Picaveras, glad you're with us on Sports Scene, a local tradition at C.P. Shuckers with locations on Shore Drive and Pacific Avenue. People love their prime ribs, seafood, and much more. You hear that, tourists? Go to C.P. Shuckers. Like both locations on Facebook and log on to cpshuckers.com. Eat or be eaten at C.P. Shuckers. Get some great burgers, pasta, seafood, bar bites with Chef Leon on Shore Drive. C.P. Shuckers. An excellent place to eat in Virginia Beach. Stay tuned. Interact with Sports Scene on Twitter at Greg Bick. Email B I C O G B at hotmail.com. Now back to Greg Bickavaris in the Hampton Roads Online Mall.com studios. It's now time for Greg's highlights presented by Hampton Roads Online Mall.com. And it was great to talk to Donald Dell, elite guest right here on Sports Scene. Don't forget GJBTV.com, like so many others are doing. Hit the YouTube link for archived shows. You can hear Donald Dell, the legendary tennis tournament chairman and co-founder of the City Open, an ATP tennis event going on at the end of this month in Washington, D.C. Really a great, great sporting event in the Mid-Atlantic sports scene as well. Of course, uh, Highlights, of course, sports highlights on NNPSTV.com as well. Question presented by Buffalo Wild Wings and Newport News to Joe Daniel. When driving, what gives you the most trouble? The right of you, the left of you, behind you, or in front of you? In traffic. Wherever, wherever there um, is another vehicle, pretty much. But always the blind spot. That's probably the, the thing that always trips me up. Just making sure I do that double check. Uh, for either a motorcycle or if we're in the city for a bike or a pedestrian or something, it's always that blind spot that seems to get me. Yeah, it's that peripheral vision that's really tough, especially coming off the interstate or merging into a lane. Then you see an 18-wheeler out of nowhere or a motorcycle out of nowhere. Right, right. Uh, I've had it uh, multiple times where you have the windshield and then you have that uh, frame, that plastic thing on your on your left and on your right fr- on the edge of the of the windshield and there's always a car or like I said, a motorcycle, a a pedestrian that's right there, like right at the center of that. And so I can't see them 
because they're not in the window part of it. They're just right there at that part where in my vehicle where it's just being blocked. And you and I have talked about manners in the road. Sometimes it exists on occasion. Uh, when you're getting off of Granby Street trying to get back to the peninsula, you might see somebody let you get in the lane. Kudos to you as well. All right. Let's ask Ian Locke the same question. Ian, when you're driving, what gives you the most trouble? Uh, hey, Greg. I'm uh, Good to see you. I think, I think I'm more of a lead foot. I think it's anyone in front of me. That's like, well, I want to get around them. Uh, it's one of those where, uh, you know, I, if I'm in the left lane and someone's going 45 on the highway or something like that, that's that's way more aggravating to me than someone trying to pass me from behind or, or anything like that. So. Oh. Uh, if you're in, in in front of me, I, I try and, uh, you know, that, that gives me the most trouble, I guess, uh, people going slow in front of me. We're talking to Ian Locke, the Media Relations Director for the Norfolk Tides. Greg Bickaveras, glad you're with us. I was going to save this segment for what teased me off, but driving through Norfolk in the flood zone, it looked like Noah's Ark. Have you ever been stuck in any flood areas down there? Um, yeah, I have a couple times. Um, I know, geez, it was probably three, four years ago where we had um, – uh, I don't know if it was a hurricane or tropical tropical storm or what that came through and uh, rained out a bunch of our games here. And it was one of those where we it was they they rained it out early and everyone went home. And I kind of stuck around to get some some cool pictures of the ballpark where the you know the since it was right on the river the floods came in a little bit and and the, the field itself was covered and the parking lots were flooded and I got some great pictures and I posted them onto our Facebook page and Twitter and. And then I said, "Okay, well, how do I how do I get out of here?" And that was the uh, the tricky part. Is uh, you know, this ballpark is, as you know, is so close to the water and kind of in the flood zone. So I was able to, to skirt up Tidewater Drive a little bit, but not without uh, kind of praying a little bit to make sure my car got through the the, the, the waters. Otherwise, I was going to spend the night here. All right, the tides right now forty and fifty six. They split yesterday. Uh, give us the lay of the land on the tides for the remainder of the season. Yeah, we're playing a little better here. Uh, we've won. Uh, we split a, a series with Durham right after the All-Star break, and Durham is actually tied for the best record in the league um, with scranton Wilkesbury, who we're playing today. Uh, we split a doubleheader with them yesterday, and we're currently playing a day game uh, where we're winning right now one nothing in the in the third inning. But uh, played a little better. You know, it's we've kind of gotten uh, solidified our pitching staff a little bit, where the Orioles have uh, gotten a little healthier, and some of the guys that were the, the fringe guys of the Orioles have been sent down. Uh, with Zach Britton and Darren O'Day coming off the disabled list, uh, we were able to get uh, pitchers named Jason Aquino and, and um, Alec Asher, both of which are, have gone into our starting rotation to help uh, solidify the tide rotation for a little bit. Um, you know, we, we know we're, we're only as good as the Orioles uh, are healthy, so if anyone gets hurt up there, we know for we're pretty certain that they're going to call some guys right back up. But for now, we're, we're pitching a lot better and we're playing better. And um, Chris Johnson, the son of uh, tied to manager Ron Johnson has, has really come on since he came off the disabled list. Uh, he's hit, he's hit uh, over 380 since I think the last dozen games or so, and he's a veteran bat. Pedro Alvarez, who's a, a veteran bat, hit a home run again last night. He's already got 18 home runs this year, so uh, starting to show little little signs of life lately. And hopefully we can continue that because we're, we're playing a bunch of tough teams coming up here in the next couple weeks. Yeah, you got Pawtucket, you got Scranton again, and Columbus. Columbus is always a crowd favorite for the Tides. Yeah, Columbus is uh, you know a lot dating back. Back in the day, when they were a Yankees affiliate, um, was always a, a, a good battle between the Tides uh, and the and the Clippers. And uh, now that they're an Indians affiliate, they've actually been really a, a really great team the last couple of years. I think they've won their division three the last four years. Um, and we played; they actually uh, battled them in a playoff appearance last time we made the playoffs in 2015. Uh, we ended up losing in five games uh, up in up in Columbus and a, a tough one run loss in the last game. But uh, Columbus and the Tides have, have a, certainly a long history going back to the you know 60s and 70s in the International League, and they're always uh, always a good draw when they come into town. When you talk about the Tides and also you know the uh, promotions, that's always a big part of attracting fans, new fans. We always talk about this is tourist season as well. There's still plenty of opportunities in. And people always realize Old Dominion plays a few home games in football. They play a few in basketball. Nobody plays more home games in any sport than the Tides does. There's still plenty of opportunity in August. Absolutely. We have, uh, you know, I think ODU football may play, what, six, seven home games a year, somewhere around there. And we, uh, we got do that in one home stand, right? <laughs> yeah, we got seven home games next week. Yeah. Uh, so there's plenty of chances to do that. We, uh, we start up on uh, July 24th, uh, Monday. We go Monday to Sunday next week where we're home. 
uh, for with Scranton Wilkesbury, who's the Yankees affiliate. So all the Yankee fans want to come out and uh, cheer for their Rail Riders. Feel free. That's a team that had Aaron Judge on the squad just last year. So. Um, and then the Columbus Clippers that we mentioned before come in for three. But uh, then we're home for a, a, a bunch in August. We have, uh, I think, it's an early three-game series with Durham, and then we play, I think, we end up with 14 of 17 days at home uh, between the middle of August and, uh, and August 31st, which is our last home game of the year. So still, uh, I think, geez, I think 20-something still home games still remain. So we got plenty of chances for people to come on out and uh, enjoy a, a, a nice night at the ballpark. We saw the American League win 2-1. to one. How about the uh, AAA All-Star game? AAA All-Star game, the uh, International League won again. Good for us. Um, so we have, we'll be home field in the AAA championship game, which is uh, held in mid-September. Not sure the Tides are going to be there. We'd have to go on a, a pretty hot run to get there. But uh, we had actually three players selected to participate in the AAA All-Star game, uh, one of which Johnny Giovatella was leading the league in hits, uh, and he didn't play for a, a reason I'm sure Johnny Giovatella was happy about. He, he got called up to Baltimore, so uh, he was unable to play in the All-Star game. But we had a relief pitcher named Jimmy Yacobonis who threw, uh, retired the two batters he faced in that All-Star game. And then uh, Chan Sisko, who is the number one prospect in the Orioles system, he ended up playing in the AAA All-Star game, which was in Tacoma, Washington, and that was just a couple days after he played in the Major League Futures game, which is uh, in Miami, Florida this year. So he went from, uh, for us, he went from Columbus, Ohio, where we were. He flew down to Miami to play in the Futures game. He had an RBI triple in that game. He, he got the start in that game. Uh, then flew to Tacoma, Washington, and then flew back to Norfolk for our series last week. So he had a, a whirlwind. He didn't really have much of an all-star break. He, he was flying all over the country, and uh, but performed really well, and uh, you know, we're excited to see him. He had three hits, three doubles, and uh, four runs batted in yesterday. So he's been playing great, and he's certainly uh, one of the, the top prospects in all of baseball. Tide's always active on social media. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, we're playing right now, so you can follow us along on Twitter and uh, Facebook as well. We uh, just posted actually a good story today. Um, I'm not sure if you saw, Greg, we, just a little bit ago. The, sure. the, league, the league announced that the uh, International League announced that they renamed um, their Executive of the Year award after Dave Rosenfield, a uh, long time as general manager. So, uh, you know, when Rosie passed away in, in late February, he, he had worked for the um, International League. I think he'd worked 48 years in the International League uh, as part of his 61 years in minor league baseball. So um, the league decided to change the name of the Executive of the Year award to name it after Dave. So. Uh, that was a pretty nice thing, but you can read read more about that on our on our Facebook page and also our website NorfolkTides dot com. And Rosie uh, would yeah. always Rosie would always tell me how close he was to the International League um, president. I mean, his chairman and commissioner as well. Yep. Yeah. I mean, him and Randy Mobley, who's sure. the league president, have gone back for a long, long time. And uh, Dave was actually the vice president of the year. Um, it was forty five years where he was a member of the board of directors and the league vice president. So, um, you know, he not only mentored you know, executives during his years in the IL, but players and managers as well. And uh, the naming of this annual award were really do a great job as, you know, paying tribute to his commitment to, to mentorship in the, in the league and, you know, across minor league baseball. Yep. I'll let you go, but he, he never gets enough respect as far as the credit he did to manage the egos of a young Davey Johnson and, and Bobby <laughs> Valentine. I mean, he, the stories he's going to tell you, but just about those two gentlemen alone. was. Something. Oh yeah, absolutely. Those, those teams in the early eighties and, and late, you know, early nineties, the, the teams he had, especially with the players coming up, the, you know, the 86 Mets that won the world series, they, they almost all of them were here. Uh, you know, and Rosie has some Rosie had some great stories to tell about not only Davy Johnson who managed that, but guys like you know Wally Backman, Mookie Wilson, Daryl Strawberry, Dwight Gooden, guys that were here uh, playing under Dave as well. So sure. uh, he'd certainly be missed. But the the award that the league is uh, renamed in his honor is certainly a, a really nice touch. Even back when Joe Torrey was managing the Mets too in the late seventies, yep. when he had a guy like Dave Kingman on his team. Yep, Dave, and, Dave, uh, Dave knew everybody, and he uh, did. It's, it's crazy to see the the web of of contacts that he had um so it's uh you know we certainly see miss him around here but we we appreciate every day uh, more and more that the stuff he did uh that you know he'll certain he certainly missed on a daily basis right ian all the best to you we'll talk to you next week all right sounds good thanks greg Take very care. good thank you ian lock right there from the norfolk tides panera is now the only nationwide chain that can say every item on their menu is 100 percent clean they deliver they also offer catering and a rapid pickup option Excellent soups, sandwiches, salads, cool off with some great uh, beverages and smoothies, breakfast, uh, bagels, 
uh, salads, all types of delicious food, grilled cheese, a kid's menu. They got loaves of bread. Their website, of course, is PaneraBread.com. Food as it should be. Go by the Harborview Suffolk location, the premier location in Hampton Roads at 6255 College Drive. Go by and see Christian and the great staff. Give them a call. They're open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week. Phone number 483-3670. Google Panera Bread Harborview Suffolk. You won't be disappointed. Food as it should be at PaneraBread.com. Stay tuned. We'll be back after this. You are listening to Sports Scene with Greg Bicavaris. Now, back to Greg. All right, back live right here on Sports Scene, presented by Outback Steakhouse in Kempsville at 1255 Fordham Drive. Give them a call at 523-4832. Great, excellent deals. Bold seasonings on their steaks. Open seven days a week for lunch and dinner. Late night, great appetizers, soups and salads, as well as steaks, uh, potatoes and sides, chicken ribs, chops and more. Excellent seafood, great desserts curbside takeaway dine rewards all going on go by and see mike and the friendly staff at kempsville outback steakhouse google it tourists outback steakhouse kempsville virginia beach george mclean is the owner and general manager firearms instructor of the marksman regular featured guest here once a month george welcome Greg, how are you today? Good, my friend. One question I want to ask you from the top that we have not covered. Um, a little bit over a month ago, I was on my way to Florida. And it was early in the morning, and I was driving and rode right by my sister's godfather's house and saw a fox going into his front yard. About a month ago, you saw where bear are in Virginia Beach. What should a homeowner do in that case? Well, obviously, you want to be cognizant of what's going on, you know, outside. Um, if you have, uh, you know, firearms, and I'm assuming that's the direction that we're going with it, because everyone's going to think, well, okay, I'll just get my gun and, and shoot it. Uh, need to be very careful. Uh, the, the first thing I would do would be to, to not do anything as far as grabbing my own gun. I would call 911 and uh, let the local authorities uh, know that there is a uh, – you know, a wild animal uh, running uh, in a neighborhood, uh, be it a fox, be it a bear. Bear could be a little bit more dangerous. Uh, foxes, they, especially, you know, this time of year, for whatever reason, and coming into around populated areas, uh, good chance they're, they're, they're rabid, you know, that, that they have rabies. Uh, so you'd want to stay away uh, from that particular uh, animal and, you know, let the, uh, let the professionals do their job. So they get animal control to come in. And you know, show them where it was. They'll probably have some questions for you as to far as far as where you saw the animal, how long ago, this type of thing. Let them do their job. Uh, you know, your your thing at, at this point would be to you know, get the kids out of the yard if you've got any out there. Keep yourself uh, in your house and uh, and get let let the pros uh, handle the situation. Yeah, because it can be dangerous, especially when you see a bear. One thing is to see a deer or see a raccoon or a possum, but to see a bear in your backyard, that can be really frightening. Well, it, it, it can. Uh, and, again, when people are frightened, they, they don't uh, think uh, clearly sometimes. Uh, so, again, the only thing you need to you know, remember is, is get everyone to inside the house and uh, call you know, law enforcement or you know, call you know, the dispatch 911 number. It's an emergency. You know, this animal can cause some severe damage, if not uh, severe harm to someone or death if they're you know, caught outside uh, with that particular uh, animal and let them handle it. They can, they've got the, the, the tranquilizers if they need to use that. And get the animal out of the way. If it's if it's rabid, uh, they'll be able to you know capture the animal and dispose of it. Uh, so you want to get you know, keep your animals you know, away from there. If again, as far as you can, you don't want to danger yourself in the process of doing that. But it's uh, just you know, being aware and realizing that you don't have the training to handle this. Let the pros do it. Yeah, I see deer in my yard all the time. We're talking to George McLean. Their location is 520 Industrial Park Drive in Newport News near the Fort Eustis section. Indoor shooting range, firearm sales, professional training, open seven days a week. Their phone number is 872-4130. And really, they get good hands-on experience from your wonderful staff every day, George. Thank you, Greg. Uh, um, it's, it's good to hear that. Uh, you know, Customer service is at the top of our list. Uh, we start every uh, employee meeting we have with, with the three top priorities that we have running this business. And that's number one is customer service, number two is customer service, and number three is customer service. 
Right, because it lacks in so many different businesses, and when you get good customer service, it really stands out. Uh, I, I think so. Uh, that's my own experience in other businesses that uh, that I go into, and it's it, it's certainly uh, uh, the, the the priority in the in my business. Well, let's talk about when people walk in. Not only do you have guns, you have ammunition. Talk about how big your range is. How how many uh, how many people can it house? Well, we have uh, uh, eight lanes. Uh, we have four that we call the, the short side. Those four lanes are, are 15 yards uh, long, and then we have uh, another four, five, six, seven, and eight. We call the long side, which are 25 yards. Uh, you know, the range is, is primarily a, a handgun range uh, with the right frangible ammo. Uh, will it, uh, certain long guns come on to the 223556? Uh, you know, ARs uh, will let you shoot if we have the frangible ammo. And frangible ammo is the ammo that basically when it hits the backstop, it just turns to dust. So it doesn't do any damage to the backstop, you know, no ricochet, uh, none of that stuff. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not a hundred yard range, but it's not meant to be. You know, you typically, you're not going to be shooting a handgun at a hundred yards. And again, this is primarily you know a handgun range versus long gun, but we do try to accommodate uh, some long guns. Right, all promoted by Criminal Justice and Security Institute. George McLean, the owner, general manager of the Marksman. Google it, folks. Locals and tourists, remember it. The Marksman. You can see their link on Hampton Roads Online Mall dot com. Really, something for everyone for beginners. You'll feel comfortable from the minute you walk in. Phone number 872-4130, online 24-7 with their website, The Marksman. George, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, sir. You be safe out there. You too, my friend. Thank you. Talk to you next <laughs> month. Right. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. All right, I want to thank our good friends Paul Odette from Buffalo Wild Wings and Newport News. they got the great pick and roll going on now. Excellent appetizers like the house sampler. They've got excellent wings, all the great uh, flavors of wings. Goodness gracious. They've got street tacos. They've got uh, burgers. They've got a kid's menu, beverages, desserts as well, uh, tenders and more, shareables. Everybody's talking about their shareables to start off your meal. Large crowds. They have a party menu. Go by and watch uh, golf, soccer, tennis preseason football next month at Buffalo Wild Wings in Newport News. Excellent place for uh, wings anytime as well. Of course, as they say, Wings Beer Sports right there at uh, 12150 Jefferson Avenue. Give them a call at 249-3999. Open seven days a week. Lunch, dinner, late night. And they show the UFC as well, Joe Daniel. I love me some UFC. Uh, all right, Buffalo Wild Wings right next to Patrick Henry Mall. Go by and say hello to Paul. Ask him how he's feeling. All right, let's get to what tees me off. What tees you off? Presented by Hampton Roads Online Mall.com. When you call someone to say hi and you haven't talked to them in a while, and then they start asking you for favors. Oh, wow. <laughs> really? I wouldn't have called you in the first place if I would have known that. Or when they ask you for money. <laughs> right. People who drink and then become a monster in person are on the phone. Oh, wow. Like drink alcohol, you're, you're saying? Oh, wow. Yeah. Affects your judgment. Absolutely. With or without driving. Yeah, mean drunks are the worst. I'm always, uh, I always like the happy drunks. Right. The loving drunks. How about the phony golf claps at golf tournaments? They just seem phony. <laughs> they do. They seem, well, they're, they're kind of scripted. I think there's even a sign that says, you know, clap at this time. Or they say get in the hole, whatever. <laughs> and, the ter- and the term in golf, dog leg left. Who thinks of these weird words? It looks like a dog leg. I guess. It's a spitting image of a dog leg. When you ride by a new restaurant with your family and you see the, the banner outside, just how many new garden bars and restaurants do they have? A new garden bar? I mean, what else can you do to a salad? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's only so many combinations, but some of them are, are pretty pretty creative, I think. NBC is televising the Open, the golf tournament, and they can't say part of their contract. They can't say British Open, and it used to be called the British Open. Oh, wow. Copyrights. How about this, Joe Daniel? Love this one. Flood in parking lots. Flood in parking lots? Just look around. Oh, me. yeah. the Yes, I know exactly what you're talking to, referring to. <laughs> and the flooding in Norfolk. Folks, get it right. Nobody should be going into Noah's Ark on Brambleton Avenue, Granby Street, Tidewater Drive. Absolutely ridiculous, Norfolk. Get the flooded streets fixed, especially when the tourists are here. They are embarrassed to drive to Norfolk. Unbelievable. 
unbelievable how yesterday was during a storm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's wild. And the worst part is when it's actually like a really deep hole and you don't realize it and then you go right through it and you get a flat tire or throws out your alignment or something like that. That's the worst. Right. They have sinkholes in Florida. We have flooding in Norfolk. We just have a bunch of potholes. Exactly. I want to thank legendary guest Donald Dell, Ian Locke, as well as um, George McLean from The Marksman. Thank our great producer, Joe Daniel, as well. Don't forget GJBTV.com. Hit the YouTube link. Go to GJBTV.com. Look at all the icons. All powered by Hampton Roads Online Mall.com. I'm Greg Bicavaris. We'll talk to you soon. AM 1650 WHKT Portsmouth, 92.5 FM W223CT Norfolk. For your daily supply of news and talk, we are the answer.